Hi, this is Talking Europe on France 24. Thanks for joining us. I'm Catherine Nicholson. Now, in recent weeks, the European Union's relations with the outside world have been thrown into the spotlight and strenuously tested by many issues and challenges. Well, joining us today to discuss the European Union's foreign policy is the Secretary General of the European External Action Service, a long-time Italian diplomat with extensive experience, particularly in the Western Balkans region. Stefano Sanino, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. I'd like to start uh, with some news that has shaken uh, the EU's neighbour Norway, first of all. On Thursday, a Danish national arrested on suspicion of carrying out a bow and arrow attack that left uh, five people dead at the scene. Uh, now, Norwegian police have said that the suspect has admitted the killings. It's a, a Danish person, as I said, who had previously been flagged as being radicalised. Uh, this might seem to raise questions about the sharing of police intelligence between EU states and non-EU states. Well, there is a problem in general about sharing intelligence. Uh, it's uh, unfortunately still very much a national competence uh, and uh, um, uh, intelligence community uh, tend to uh, share information only uh, uh, in a very limited circle. This is one of the reasons why we are trying also to create at the European Union level a sort of embryo of what could be uh, a, an intelligence uh, community at the European level. We have uh, the uh, representative of the intelligence communities mm -hmm. The 27 member states that are trying to work together in order to have a common assessment of the mm -hmm. threat and challenges that we have in front of us. All right, I'd like to move on and look at one of the EU's most pressing concerns perhaps now Afghanistan. Uh, the country itself facing a humanitarian crisis following the takeover of the government by the Taliban in the summer. Now, on, on Tuesday, European leaders held talks with the Taliban. And does this mean that the European Union is recognising the Taliban in a formal way? <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. We are uh, uh, not recognising the Taliban. And this is, and we have a non-recognition policy uh, for the time being. Um, and, but we need at the same time to engage with the uh, uh, new uh, authorities in, uh, in Kabul and in Afghanistan because we still have a lot of work to do in order to support the population mm -hmm. of Afghanistan that have been, uh, that is living a very uh, difficult situation following the, uh, um, uh, the withdrawal of our military presence from there. So our effort is very much focused on the support to uh, the people of Afghanistan to provide them with humanitarian assistance, to provide them with the basic services and to help them uh, uh, to go through this difficult situation. And also at the same time putting also some pressure on the new authorities so that they can uh, 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 help and support uh, their own population mm. in the best possible way. Well, indeed, uh, the EU has had uh, quite a strong focus on delivering aid, uh, including to neighbouring countries in Afghanistan, uh, there has been a lot of talk about uh, the likelihood of uh, a new wave of Afghan people trying to come to Europe uh, as asylum seekers. And of course, it's a complicated, uh, controversial issue in Europe. Is the aim of this EU aid policy to try and keep Afghans in the region, stop them reaching European soil? No, honestly, I think that, uh, and as I said before, uh, our aim is to uh, help the, Af the Afghan people. This is a commitment that we have taken uh, with the Afghan population following uh, the withdrawal of, of our troops and of our forces. We want to be sure, we want to make it sure that they uh, are able to uh, um, take their life again, to recreate hope for the future in, uh, in, in this country. Mm -hmm. And then certainly there are preoccupations, there are preoccupations that the country could not turn again into a crandle for terrorism or for terrorist attacks. We are also worried uh, that the, uh, uh, the collapse of the country could uh, generate a, a migratory wave, but it's a problem not only for us, it would be a problem for the, uh, uh, for the people who uh, would be obliged to leave their own countries and start a very complex journey uh, uh, towards the European Union. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, from that point of view, once again, the objective and the clear objective is how we can support the Afghan people. 
Okay, I'd like to um, look at something somewhat closer to home for the EU, uh, the Western Balkans region. I mentioned that you're somewhat of an expert uh, in that area. Now, there was a recent summit between the EU and Western Balkans nations looking uh, particularly at the, the issue of enlargement as well. We've, we've got a couple of sound bites for you and our viewers to listen to on this issue. Firstly, Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission President, and also a comment from the Prime Minister of Kosovo. And the European Union is not complete without the Western Balkans. So my commission will continue to do its utmost to advance the enlargement process and the region's EU integration. We want the Western Balkan in the European Union. There cannot be any doubt that our goal is enlargement. It has been a great injustice. Uh, lack of fairness towards uh, citizens uh, of our country, which uh, suffered a lot. That was uh, Albin Kurti, the Kosovan Prime Minister, expressing some frustration there um, around that uh, summit on the Western Balkans. Uh, just on the enlargement issue, Ursula von der Leyen speaking strongly in favour of it there, but the final declaration uh, after the summit said that the EU first had to deepen its own development, ensuring its capacity to integrate new members. Uh, Stefano Sanino, just to, to ask you, you know, to someone in a Western Balkans country, that might sound like the EU is happier to talk about enlargement than to actually act on it. No, I think that the, uh, uh, we are also acting in terms of not uh, uh, denying and uh, not trying to hide the difficulties that we are going through. We have gone through a number of uh, uh, crises uh, within the European Union, from the financial uh, crisis to the health crisis of COVID-19, and we are still uh, um, not yet out of this. But uh, this does not mean that the uh, uh, perspective of the uh, uh, European Union is to have the countries uh, uh, of the Western Balkans as part of the family. And I think that President von der Leyen was very clear in, 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 in saying, in, in giving the, uh, mm. uh, the political message. Then, I mean, uh, uh, in all these cases, there are uh, responsibilities on both sides. I think that we need, uh, on, uh, on our side, on the side of the European Union, to be clear and, and inequivocal mm -hmm. about the fact that we want them in. Um, at the same time, we need also to have a sort of unequivocal uh, commitment on their side to uh, uh, be part of the European Union, not to play with uh, um, other um, possible uh, um, international actors. From mm. that point of view, I want to stress also what the uh, Albanian Prime Minister has very recently stated, mm -mm. where he was saying that uh, uh, Albania uh, is very solidly anchored to the European Union and to his alliance, set of alliances and is not playing any card with any third country. Another EU uh, neighbour that's uh, had a summit with the EU uh, recently, Ukraine. Uh, the recent summit there ended with a, an aerospace deal and uh, several billion euros worth of EU aid. Uh, there is still, though, a big question to be asked about the seven-year-old separatist conflict in the Donbass region, uh, which is continuing on. Ukraine uh, is a very uh, close ally to the European Union, and the European Union has invested heavily uh, politically and economically in, uh, in Ukraine. It's been very supportive of the territorial integrity of the country. Mm -hmm. You see our uh, policy of non recognition of the illegal annexation of, uh, of Crimea, as well as the, uh, 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 the instability that has been generated in eastern Ukraine. And we expect, on the other hand, that Ukraine's continue uh, to uh, fight strongly corruption and to uh, uh, work in order to mm -hmm. uh, create a, a better environment uh, for the rule of law in, uh, in their own country. And uh, another issue that's very important to Ukraine and the EU, uh, the gas supply into the EU. Uh, Europeans are currently seeing their energy prices skyrocket, some accusing Russia of tightening the screws or indeed the gas taps on Europe. Russia's representative to the EU, though, said recently the crisis would be easily resolved if Europe stopped treating Russia as a, an enemy or an adversary. What would you say back to that? I would say that it's uh, not the European Union that has chosen this path. It was uh, Russia that chose this path, again, uh, um, referring to uh, what they did in Ukraine, both with uh, uh, Crimea and uh, um, with the uh, uh, eastern Ukraine, but also the downing of the plane, where essentially uh, uh, the, the problem was not only 
with the downing in itself, but also with the lack of cooperation in trying to uh, um, have an inquiry and even in uh, um, helping the families to uh, uh, collect the, uh, uh, mm -hmm. the bodies of their, 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 their own uh, members of the family. So, I mean, the choice of confrontation is a choice that has been uh, uh, decided mm -hmm. by Russia, not by the European Union. Notwithstanding, we are continuing engaging with Russia. While we are very firm on our policy vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what they are doing in the area of rule of law, what they are doing with the political opponents, but at the same time we are also trying to uh, uh, engage Russia in areas which are of common interest and uh, in areas where we think that uh, we have to work together and we do recognize that uh, Russia has an important role to play. So we want to have a, a predictable relationship with, uh, with Russia. We are working in that direction and we hope mm -hmm. that Russia will be able to uh, um, um, come to terms with, uh, with this situation mm -hmm. and being able to work with us more constructively. Just got time for a brief question about a big subject, China. Uh, the United States uh, wants to get European allies on board with its approach. Um, there have been issues particularly uh, with Taiwan uh, regarding Lithuania recently as well. Does the EU favour aligning with Americans on China policy? Or have European fingers perhaps been burned by the lack of American cooperation uh, in Afghanistan, for example? No, I think that uh, when it comes to China, um, uh, we have uh, a very um, uh, solid and consistent uh, uh, policy. We have said since uh, the very beginning, from 2019, when we have had a sort of a policy, uh, the determination of the policy line of the European Union, that China was at the same time a partner, a competitor and a systemic rival. So on this we will continue to be very clear with, uh, with China, including in terms of security, including in the area of the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. And if I have to, uh, uh, to look at the evolution of the position of the United States, States, I see that they are also embracing this kind of more complex attitude. Well, Stefano Sanino, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks to you for watching as well. I hope to see you in part two of the programme in a couple of minutes' time.